Hello, all you Calc BCers out there. Um, this should be our last video of notes for the year, really. Um, from here on out, it's the AP test and probably communicate once or twice again, but this will, for the most part, conclude the lessons and everything that you would do before you would take that AP test. There's no final to be concerned about, so this is pretty much going to wrap up uh, me just in terms of presenting any sort of a, a calculus topic moving forward. So enjoy. What you're going to find on this one is with the AP test being open note, open calculator, it's probably a little less important that we know how to, let's say I give you a function, all these random things, sine of x plus e to the x plus an inverse tangent of x. Should you know those? Yeah, you, you really should, just to make sure. At least have the notes next to you where you can look those up very quickly if you were to forget. But knowing that this is open notes, open book, you can Google this stuff, that they're going to try, and my guess, minimize these types of questions. What they're going to give you is a lot. My, my anticipation would be they're going to have to give you some literal types of equations where you're given these. And we've done these throughout the course of the year. Is it necessarily anything new? But I do want to focus on some old questions where, if you notice, you're not necessarily given a function at all. We're just given, you know, h of x, f of x, g of x. So the theme throughout all of these is how can we handle these when we're not given these functions? Again, these literal terms here that you can't simply plug into your calculator. Okay, all the way down to this third one where they're going to have you do integration by parts and use substitution where you're not actually given functions to work with, okay? So that's gonna be our theme. That's what we're gonna be going through with these problems. So this is part of an old AP question. Given a bunch of data, actually one of these I had put in a review packet as well. I've supplemented this question though as well. The functions f and g are differentiable for all numbers and then g is strictly increasing. The table above gives values of the functions and the derivatives. The function h is given by, then you're given that function. I'm actually going to jump to number two first because this is not new. Number one is somewhat new. If you've watched all the review videos, we've, we've come across it once or twice. I want to talk about it one more time just in case you were to see this next week. So number two first, it explains why there must be. So if you remember, when we start talking must be over an interval, and then you are told that this function is differentiable, and we know that differentiable guarantees that we are also continuous. When we start seeing these in combination, continuous and differentiable, and start talking about what must be true, must be false, a lot of times they're eventually getting to the mean value theorem, and that's what this one is going to be getting at. So they want you to show that over this interval, that somewhere we get a derivative value for h of 5. The table above has no information for h, but we should be able to use the table to show that h is derivative would have to have a value of negative 5 someplace. And we're going to do that with the mean value theorem. So if you remember, the mean value theorem is when our instantaneous rate of change, so h prime, which is ultimately what we needed to equal as a 5, that would have to equal the average rate of change. And in this case, our interval is 1 to 3. So what we would do, if I could show that this average rate of change problem for h over 1 to 3, if we could show that this is a negative 5, then the instantaneous rate of change would have to also then equal a negative 5. The mean value theorem guarantees the average rate of change will equal the instantaneous rate of change someplace. So that's what we would want to do. So we're going to set up h of 3 minus h of 1. Here is h. So this first one would be f of g of 3 minus f of g of 1 all over 3 minus 1. Sorry, this should be 3 minus 1. <clears throat> We would then want to figure out what these values are. Actually, let me try to get this in underneath. So save some space. Use our values from above. So g of 3, if we look up at our table, g of 3 is 4. So we would want f of 4 ultimately. Then I would want f of g of 1. So g of 1 is 2. And then all over 2. All right, f of 4 then, we can use our table as well as a negative 1 minus f of 2, which is 9, all divided by 2. What we then see here is we've just shown that our average rate of change is a negative 5. Therefore, that guarantees our instantaneous rate of change equals a negative 5. Um, you, you want to put it into words. Ultimately, what they would be looking for here is that you use the phrase 
the mean value theorem. The mean value theorem guarantees the average rate of change equals your instantaneous rate of change. Oops. I'm going to abbreviate a little bit. Okay. There's another uh, theorem. Go down to number four. It says, is this a true statement? And it says, on the interval, close interval from one to four, the minimum value... No, sorry. Number three is the next one I want to do. Explain why the function f must have a maximum value on this interval. All right. What this is getting at is what we talked about as the extreme... Oops extreme value theorem that as long as I have a continuous function the reason we know for a fact that we are continuous is right here if we are differentiable if f is differentiable that guarantees we are also continuous being continuous doesn't guarantee we're differentiable but differentiable does guarantee we are continuous as long as we are continuous on a closed interval which we are we are guaranteed a maximum and a minimum. So that's pretty much what this is. We're continuous on a closed interval. Therefore, we must have a maximum value due to what we call the extreme value theorem. So those we've talked about, mean value theorem, the extreme value theorem, those are not new. There is another one called, and we talked about this a little bit in one of those review packets so just in case let's hit on this again since this is not something we really delved into too much and this does appear every once in a while extreme value theorem or I'm sorry the intermediate value theorem so intermediate kind of means the in-between it's not the extremes like this one it's in between intermediately number one explain why there must be a value of r between 1 and 3 such that h of r is a negative 5. So now we need functional values of this. What the intermediate value theorem basically says, so don't worry about this problem yet. If I have a continuous function, which we do, you're told that this is a continuous function, and let's say at negative 1 we're down here to negative 4, and let's say at 5 over here, or up here at a value of 10. <clears throat> as long as I have a continuous function, there's no way for us to know how this point would connect to this point. But whether I draw in a straight line, whether I draw in a, you know, a curve like this, if I want to get really creative, I could actually go down, come back up, and then eventually come up through this point. What the intermediate value theorem is saying is there's no possible way that we can't hit every single value between this negative 4 or whatever I have here, negative 4 and this value of 10. So I would have to hit every value in between. So do we have to hit the y value of 2? Yeah, we hit it here in the black one, here in the red one, here in the blue one. Do we have to hit a value of a y value of a negative 1? Yeah, we hit it here, here, and then there. So the intermediate value theorem guarantees we hit every value in between. That would have to be true for continuous. So <clears throat> if we're going to be doing it from 1 to 3, what we would want to know is what was h of 3 and what is h of 1. And this, since we did number 2 first, you've already found these things out. We found out that h of 3 became f of 4, which ultimately gave us a value of a negative 1. We found out that f, or sorry, h of 1, which is what we need here, that simplified to be f of 2, which ultimately gave us a positive 9. Okay, you may not know this, but I <coughs> had to pause this to go back because this isn't going to work. And I made a little mistake when I rewrote this problem. Change this to a positive 5. All right, so what we're trying to show is h of r would have to have a value of a positive 5. This was a negative 5. This one should be a positive 5. So now what that then means is if I know at 1 I have a y value of 9 
and I know that at the x value of 3, I have a y value of a negative 1. The fact that this is a continuous graph, there's no way, as we made our way from this point to this point, no matter how I would have gone from the top point to the bottom point, somewhere I had to have hit the value of 5. That's the intermediate value theorem. And then again, ultimately, you can just pretty much say that. So those are our three main theorems. This one we've talked about. This we've talked about. This one we didn't really talk about. You've now seen it two or three times in the reviews. So just be prepared for that just in case. All right, number four. Is this a true statement? On the interval from 1 to 4, the minimum value of f, so now let's revert to f, is a negative 1. So if we look at our function f is here, here is its functional values that we know of, and it's saying, is the minimum value a negative 1? Do we know that for sure? Hopefully, we understand that that is not necessarily true. Might be. Yeah, it's the smallest value that this was given to, but there's nothing saying, so here's 1, 6. Uh, let's plot the next one would have been 2, 9, say is here. The next one you were given is 3, 10, and then this last point was 4, negative 1. So yeah, if our graph looks like this, then that would be our minimum value. But there's nothing saying that that's exactly what it has to look like. Again, we can be creative. We could come down here, then come up. We can come down here again. I know it's not a function yet, but we could have dropped in here. We could definitely go lower than this. The only thing we have to do is hit these three values. Okay. All right, five, let w be a function given by. Here's uh, one of our fundamental theorems of calcs. We just want to take the derivative of this. So again, be able to do this when it's written in terms of just literal functions. We're taking the derivative of this integral, so that should cancel. Whatever our variable limit gets plugged in, so we would get f of g of x. And then we'd have to multiply by whatever we just plugged in, that derivative, so g prime of x. Very common, something certainly we want to be able to handle. Plug in your 3, so we would get f of g of 3 times g primed of 3. We now have to revert to our table here to get these values. So I want f of g of 3, so g of 3 is 4, minus, or times, g primed of 3, that. So we go up and figure out what's g's derivative value at 3. That would be 2. So then ultimately we need f of 4 times 2. So I'll go to our table, find f of 4. f of 4 was a negative 1. All right. So 6 then uh, typically causes major issues with the whole inverse idea. The scores on these types of questions are always really bad, whether they're multiple choice or even on the free response portion, which this one was. It, don't overthink it too much. It's a line tangent question first and foremost. So we know we need a point. We also know we're going to need some sort of a slope, which always involves our derivative. What's tricky about this is what you have to remember, we're doing this with the inverse. So if you remember, think of g of x think of the inverse of g of x. I'm going to make this point up. Let's say the point 4, 5 is on the original function. That means the point 5, 4 is going to be on the inverse of this function. So if we think about that with respect to our value, since we're going to be doing this from our table when x is a 2, that really means is um, we're going to be looking for if this is the x value of 2 is the x value for the inverse, that would have been the y value for the original function g. So since we again want x on the inverse, so this here is going to be our x value, we want that to be a 2, that would have been the y value on the original function. 
if we go up to our table and go to the g of x column, here is where we have g of x equal to 2. So that point would have been 2 comma 1 for the inverse. So that is the point that lies on the inverse graph of g. If you remember the slope there were two options. One of them is we actually found the inverse of the function and then took the derivative of it. Well, like I said, we can't find the inverse of this function because we don't actually know what the function is. Uh, g is just given to us as a generic old g of x. We don't have that defined by anything. The other way that we could do this is, if you remember, the derivative of the inverse was the reciprocal. So I'll write it like this. The derivative of the inverse of a function is really just the reciprocal of, of the original derivative. So if we go back up and find out what this was, at this point, the regular slope at that point was 5. So our slope had to have been the reciprocal of that, which is 1 over 5. It's not the opposite reciprocal, just the reciprocal. Once we have that, that's our line. Those always, always score awful. Okay, but again, not uncommon for us to see those. Okay, last thing you may have to do with the table. Um, well, I shouldn't say the last thing, but another thing is do an antiderivative. So again, we've done this a little bit in the reviews if you've been catching on or following along. But just as a refresher, since it's kind of the theme of this packet, let's say we wanted to do an antiderivative. What I've mentioned um, throughout the year and then in our review video, that if we have a function we don't know, so we don't know g primed, but we do know part of the other integral, or the, oh, what did I do there? Um, the other integral, which we do, we know we're integrating 2, and we're going to do it from 1 to 4. These are the types that we probably want to split up. Two different methods of then doing these. This one here is the very first type of antiderivative or in definite integral that we've ever done. It's really just 2 times dx. The dx from 1 to 4 would be 3. So we know this right away has a, three, a 6 for a value. If you needed to do the antiderivative, you could. 2x from 1 to 4. Then you do upper limit minus your lower limit. You'll get a 6 that way. So either way, that should be a 6 here. This we have to do a little differently because it's a different type of a function. This one, if we do the antiderivative of g primed, that takes us to g of x, and then we'd want to go from 1 to 4, and the reason that is nice is we have values for g of x up here from 1 to 4. So if we just carry out that problem and do your upper limit minus our lower limit, Whatever this gives us, we're going to subtract the 6 from. So find g of 4 at the top, find g of 1 at the top. So we get, what, 7 minus 5. So g of 4 was 7. g of 1 was 5. So this is going to give us a 2. We're then going to subtract our 6. So that is, what, 2 minus a 6 would be a negative 4. All right. Next question. <clears throat> don't give us values for our derivative, or don't give us the function for our derivative, but they just give us a bunch of values. They then tell us that f of 0 is 20. They tell you that the first derivative satisfies this inequality. So our derivative values, we have some of them marked for us. So these are obviously all of our derivative values here, but they're only derivative values at certain points. We don't know what's happening in between those values other than all of our derivative values have to fall between 0 and 7. Selected values of f prime are shown on the table. The function has a, a continuous second derivative also. 8. Pretty straightforward with number 8. Using a midpoint Riemann sum, so that's just our rectangles, so we're going to do midpoint rectangles. We want three subintervals. This says of equal length. So because of that, we can go ahead and use our little change in x is going to be your base. We're going from 6 to 0, and we want three rectangles. So we want, we want each base to be a 2. I'd have you draw these in, here's 0 to 2, go over another 2 to 4, another 2 to 6, here's rectangle 1, 2, and 3. We wanted midpoints, so the values we're ultimately concerned about are here, here, and then here. 
So if we wanted to then approximate the value of f of 6, maybe we should have talked about that as well, but we know we're going to definitely be doing this. What we really want to know, if we want f of 6, consider where we know we're at at 0. So we, we know, think of it this way, we're going to take our initial value. We're going to add it to the change in our value. Well, the initial value that you were given here is 20. And what we want to do is add the change in the value of f. Typically, that means integrals. That's what integrals mean. So if we could somehow integrate from 0 to 6, f prime of x, that would give us f of x from 0 to 6. But we don't have that function. So we have to approximate it. Our approximation methods are either rectangles or trapezoids. Number eight here is telling us to do rectangles. So we're going to do our rectangles. So rectangle number one, we would do its height times its base. Its base is going to be the two. All of them would be. And the midpoint functional value is 3.5. Plus rectangle number two has a base of two. Its height at the midpoint is a 0.8. Rectangle number 3 has a base of 2, and then its height at the midpoint is 5.8. So this is our Riemann sum. This will give us how much our value has changed over the interval of 0 to 6. And then whatever that is, you're going to add that up and uh, add that up to 20, and then that should be our answer. So let me throw all that in. 7 plus 1.6 plus 5 times 2. should give us 20.2 so that's how much we have changed by doing our our sums add that to where we began at 20 and our approximate values let's use an approximation symbol here would be 40.2 number nine uh, determine if the actual value of f of 6 could be 70 so this is our approximation and then the question is determine the actual value of f of 6 or if we could determine it, would it possibly be able to equal 70? So here's what this is getting at. And it, again, some of these, you really got to think, why are they giving us this and the setup of this problem? So if you look up here at this inequality, the reason that inequality was given to you is for number nine, if we want to determine this. So think about what we were definitely going to have to do with this. You would have started at 20, just like we would have done up here. But basically what we would want to do is let's create the biggest. So I'm going to add the biggest change in F that I possibly could. So think about how we could accomplish all of that. What we're doing is adding up the areas of rectangles. So this is how we did that. So here's one area. Here's another area. Here's another area. Well, the way we can make the biggest possible value is if we made every single one of these the largest allowable value. And that largest allowable value is given to us by this inequality. If our derivative was always 7, and then we did the value of that, that should give us the largest possible value that we could possibly get based upon our restrictions. So the way that we could set that up do our 20, and then what we would just want to do is integrate over 0 to 6, just like we basically did up here using rectangles, right? We're basically doing this, f primed, right? But instead of just using a generic f prime, we would want to use the biggest possible value that we could, and we would just want y prime to always be 7, just like I have up here in the red. And then let's see what this now gives us. This is really just 7 times the difference in x. The difference in x is 6. So we would end up with 20 plus 42. 62 would be the largest possible value we could get if our derivative was always a positive 7. So the answer to this would be no. And as long as you showed this work, they don't necessarily say explain. As long as you can justify that with your work, then you would be good. Similar to the previous question, 
If this is f double prime and we did the antiderivative of this, that would take us to f prime from 2 to 4. And then very conveniently, we have a bunch of f prime values in our table. So let me erase this. So now that we have f prime, we're going to do f primed of 4 minus f primed of 2, just the upper limit minus your lower limit. We can get these values from our table above. So f primed of 4 is 1.7. f primed of 2 is 2. So that should give us a negative 0.3. 11. Simple little limit problem where the first option with any limit is to try and substitute. So that's what we would try and do. We would want to do f of 0 minus 20 times e to the 0. Turn the space here. Divide that by 0 0.5 times f of 0. And then subtract 10. Go to our table. Let's get some of these values now. I guess we just need f of 0 for both. And f of, or f, wait a minute. Uh, the table, yeah, actually... I said table, table's not going to do us any good. These are f prime values. We want f of 0. So f of 0 is that 20 right there. So that we can just plug in the value of 20. So we would do 20 minus e to the 0 is going to be a 1. So we would end up with 20 minus 20. This would be 0.5 times f of 0, which is given to us as 20, and then minus 10. So you get a 0 on top. Half 20 is 10. Take away 10, you're going to get a 0 on the bottom. And then everybody's favorite thing is L'Hopital's rule. Now that we've done that, um, pretty common issue, we can do L'Hopital's rule for this. So our next step is let's evaluate the limit as x goes to 0 with our derivatives. The derivative of f, we would just mark with a little tick mark. And then the derivative of 20 e to the x would just be 20 e to the x again. Denominator, this derivative here, the 0 0.5 would just drop down. The derivative of f is f prime of x. The derivative of 10 would go away. So we try this again. Plug in your 0. Now that we want f prime values, now we use the table. So we visit our table. f prime to 0 is 4. So in both of those spots down here, you're going to have 4 minus 20 and then 0 0.5 times 4. So that would give us a negative 16, and then half of 4 is 2. Our limit is going to be 8. Again, L'Hopital's rule only if we get indeterminate. That usually means uh, 0 over 0 is the type that they test you on. This one. These we now have not necessarily done with literal terms without actual functions given to us. And that's some integration technique. So I did want to give you this one. This one I actually copied off of the College Board site. So you can kind of see the cut and pasted picture here. Because I did want you to see something like this. So for 0 to 5, the function f is continuous and differentiable. So that's important. A portion of the graph of f is obscured by a coffee stain. So that's not a blotch. They deliberately say that they're going to block that out. It is then known that 0 to 4, if I integrate this function, is 8. So think about what that would mean. We can find the area underneath this curve from 0 to 4, and we know that's going to be an 8. So we got that. The next one, if we go from 4 to 3, that's going to be a negative 3. So right away, kind of notice that those are flipped. So we could say that if I integrate from 3 to 4, that's going to be a positive 3. So we don't really know where this graph ends, but we do know the area right here is going to be a 3. Then the function is linear on the intervals from 0 to 1, so that just tells us right here to here it's a line. And then from 4 to 5, so from here to here we have a line. Anywhere greater than 5, so notice how the graph up here ends at 5. So there is stuff going to be going on over here. There's a graph. The graph is given to you by this function here. A is some positive real number. Then what they're going to test you now on is some integration methods that we have to recognize 
how to do when they're not when we don't actually have functions to work with. We just are given generic Fs and Gs. All right, so number 12. We, we've done some antiderivatives, these simple ones here, like the antiderivative of F double primed is F prime. The antiderivative of G primed would be G of X. This one's a little trickier. So when we now look at how this is written, notice how this is a product between two different terms. Our first option with antiderivatives, when they're not nice and simple, straightforward, one-step little antiderivatives, is use substitution. And then our second option, if it is a product, is the whole integration by parts. So with this one, there's really no way if we start thinking, all right, what can I let u equal? Let's actually compare 12 and 13 so you understand what I'm alluding to. There's nothing I could really pick for u. Like if I pick u as f prime, my du is going to be f double prime. That doesn't do us any good. If we pick our u as the 2x, then the derivative of that is 2. That doesn't do us any good. We don't get this f prime of x taken care of. So u substitution for this one won't work. But if you look at the second one, and think about how this now might play out. If I let u be x squared minus a 1, notice how this derivative will give you a 2x dx, and then we're going to be able to divide that 1 half over, and we now have f of u, and then we can get rid of that x dx in this problem if we replace it with a 1 half du. So 13, we are going to use, use substitution in a minute. This would be our first couple of steps, so don't necessarily erase that. But just recognize how in 13, u substitution would work. Number 12, u substitution doesn't work. If u substitution doesn't work and you have a product, that means you're probably doing integration by parts. So if you remember integration by parts, where we would have to assign some part of this integral as u, the other part as dv, our u as a general rule was whichever term of those would go away eventually as a derivative, and that would be 2x. Recall, if there's a natural log in here, that's almost always going to be your u. That's the better bet. But in this case, we can follow our general rule. This is the one you want to be your u. And then f prime of x is going, dx is going to be your dv. And if you remember, we took the derivative of this, so we would get 2 dx, and then we did the antiderivative of f prime, which would just take us to the original function f. So integral from 0 to 4 for 2x times f prime of x dx would equal u v minus the integral of v du. So that would be the integral from 0 to 4. And then integrating 2 f of x dx. Okay, so this one has already been evaluated. This one we have the antiderivative of. This one we now need to figure out. This one we can do, again, two different integrals now, two different types of problems. You're going to do these separately. This one we can now do. We've already done the antiderivative. We're going to evaluate this from 0 to 4 because those were our original limits over here. So we're going to plug in the upper limit of 4. So that would give me 8 times f of 4. Minus, when I plug in my 0, I would get 0 times f of 0. So then that obviously is going to cancel. 8 times f of 4. So if we come over here, here is f of 4. We can actually use the graph for this. We know what that equals. f of 4 is right here, and that's a value of 3. So we'd have 8 times 3, so that this value is 24 because then we just would have had a zero for this one. So, so I don't run into this next problem. I'm going to go ahead and erase this. And we know that this has a value of 24, and we would now need to subtract away whatever this value is. So to do that, I'm going to pull the two out, so it's a little easier visual for you to look at. We somehow need to evaluate this. So here now is a little um, thing to be aware of. If we do the antiderivative of x, that can be done to show that now, since this is our, like if this was f prime, then this is clearly f of x. 
If this was f double prime, then the antiderivative is f prime. Well, what happens if we're dealing with f of x already? So what we said, whether we remember this or not, the way we would show that is we change the case of it. Instead of a lowercase f, we write it as a capital F. That's how we would show that. Well, think about what would happen if we did that for this problem from 0 to 4. I do capital F of 4 minus capital F of 0. How are we going to get these? We were not given any information regarding some sort of a capital F of 4. So in this case, we don't really actually want to do the antiderivative like we did earlier with, if I can get back to it, like we did with this problem. We actually did the antiderivative. In this problem, we actually took g primed and we did the antiderivative to get g of x. In this case, that doesn't do us any good. We have to have a different way of evaluating this. So when we integrate a function, so now we're back to this original problem. Here's what we're trying to figure out. And yes, this is not easy. We have the graph to figure this out. And even this still isn't necessarily easy. When we integrate f, and you're looking at the graph of f, that's the area underneath. So we need the area from here to here. We don't know what that curve is, though, because we've spilled coffee on that. So that's clever of them. But what we do know, and again, think about what we're trying to find. We're trying to go from 0 to What we do know, we really don't even need the graph, I guess, but we do know what this value is, right? This was given to us. This whole area under here, so that was just from 3 to 4, but all of this we know to be 8. So we would do minus 2, and then again, this value here was what was given to us as a value of 8. So what we would have, we can create a little bit of space here so we can differentiate between these. We'd have a 24 minus a 16, so that our answer would ultimately end up being 8. All right. 13. This is u substitution. So we would have already had that set up. So now let's go ahead and set up what we would have over here x squared minus a 1 we set as our u, and then this x dx we can get rid of with a 1 half and a du. So I've talked about this a number of times. A lot of us ask about it. Every year it gets asked about, here is when you have to change your limits. If you have to do u substitution on the AP test and you don't change your limits, they're going to take off a point because we're not talking about equivalent functions anymore. If you recall, these values were x values. They were intended to be plugged in for the variable x. We now have variables u. So we needed to convert those. And the place we always converted them is with this initial substitution, that u is always equal to your x value squared minus a 1. Look at your original x value for the lower limit. That was a 1. If we plug that in, our lower, value, or lower limit becomes a 0. Your original upper limit was a 2 for x. Plug that in for your x. Your upper limit should become a 3. 13. Similar to the previous problem, this is not going to do us any good to do a capital F of u from 0 to 3. We don't have any capital F values. So we have to use our graph or we have to use what we were given. So if we now go back up to the top here, I can move the paper. We still want to integrate f. So this is still the function f, but we now want to be going from 0 to 3. So think about what we just talked about. The whole area here, so we'll do this here, was 8. But what we also talked about right here is that from 3 to 4, so let me do that in red, was 3. So if the whole thing is 8, that's all the black area that I have shaded, somewhat shaded in black, is 8. And from 3 to 4 is 3. Well, if we just want from 0 to 3, 
it would have to be 5. It would be the entire value of 8 decreased by the value in between 3 and 4, which was 3. That's why this here would have to be 5. Hopefully this is making some sense. This here is going to be 3. That's how, that's how we would still get the overall value of 8. So what that means is I would do 1 half multiplied by, and then if I integrate f from 0 to 3, I get a value of 5. So my answer should be 2.5. 14 now, if you wanted to you know, pause me a little bit, you have another product. Maybe think, all right, is this going to be a U substitution problem? Because certainly we can't just look at that and, and know what that antiderivative is. So it's definitely going to involve U substitution or integration by parts. And see if you wanted to try to work your way through that one. This is a nice one, I think, now that we've done 12 and 13. If you wanted to try it, go ahead. Pause me, see if you can get through it. We'll move along. For this one, this is going to be U substitution. It works out nicely that if we let u be sine of x, du is going to be a cosine of x, and then the dx. So if we come over here, we can now write this as, actually, let me get rid of that because we may not want that old limit anymore. But what we would definitely have is f primed of u, because the sine of x was our u, and then nicely, cosine of x dx is our du. So this cosine of x and the dx will go away with your du. We're going to integrate from, we need to get new limits. Why do I keep doing that? So let's get our new lower limit. This 0 had been intended to plug in for x, so we need to convert it. So let your x be a 0, we get sine of 0. So I guess I was right all along when I kept putting that 0 down. Still going to remain a 0. Our upper limit was a pi over 2. You're going to have to plug that in. Sine of pi over 2 is a 1. From here now, we can go ahead, do our, this, the, okay, so now we do want to think about, before we've done this antiderivative, this should actually do okay now, because think about what we will end up with. We're going to end up with the regular function f, when our antiderivative, and we have a bunch of stuff to work with with f, whether it be the graph, whether it be this, this, so most likely this would be our, our process. Oops. So we're going to do f of u, and we're going to evaluate that from 0 to 1, and then we would do f of 1 minus f of 0. We can then go to our graph, find these values. Eventually, if this thing will move for me. So f of 1, we can see, oh my goodness. Undo that. And if we look at our graph, f of 1, you can do that at the top. f of 1 is 2. f of 0 is a negative 1. I'm sorry, f of 0 is 3. And then 2 minus 3 is a negative 1. Last one. We have our improper integral again. So can we do an improper integral? if we don't actually have a function to work with, and that's what this one is, is getting at. So it is known that if we went from 3 to infinity, so let's go back up to my graph, let's clear some space here. So this is saying if we found the area from 3 to infinity, so if this, you know, the graph to the right of this solidifies this, and we integrate forever and ever and ever, that when we do that, that this is going to have overall a value of 9. All right. So with that knowledge, we want to find the value of a. So here's what this gets at now. Notice how the graph ends at 5. So we talked about that at the beginning. We can see that visually if we just look at it. And then what you were told is when we get greater than 5, this is the function that we are concerned about. So it's going to be a combination of a couple of things here. So we're going to set up, I'm going to set up two integrals to kind of show you what we would need to do. The one integral is going to go from 3 to 5, integrating that graph. 
but then the other one has to go from 5 to infinity, integrating the function that you were given to work with. Let's see what that is again. The 4 over x minus a quantity squared. And when we do that, we know that has to equal 9. So we just basically set up a little equation here. <laughs> this, you now need to decide, do I actually want to do the antiderivative of f and create a capital F out of this? We've already talked about that. It doesn't do us any good because we don't have any information for a capital F. So then we want to understand that we can integrate a function by the area. So if we go up to the graph above, so go to your graph above, go between 3 and 5, and we want to integrate that curve. And that we can do. So let me create some space. So what we're really doing is going from 3 to 5, and then we have this curve over here that would, you know, join and go on forever. But what we now know is from 3 to 5, we could figure this out. Um, we already know from 3 to 4. So from here to here, we were already told or found, we have it circled right here, that this is a value of 3. And then if we just kind of figure these areas, here's an area of 1, here's another area of 1, this square is an area of 1, and then we have a triangle up here. That's a 1 by a 2, that's 2, and then half of that is going to be a 1, so that's another 1. So overall, that area is going to be 7, from 3 to 5. So from 3 to 5, let me write that in, we know that this area is 7. So if we go back down, we know we have 7 plus, and then now we have a little more guidance on this one. Let's go ahead and write the, well, let's leave it in infinity for a minute. We now know that this actually equals 2. All right, because we know that the 3 to 5 part is a 7. Those together have to add up to be a 9. So what we now know, and now let's do this problem, that 5 to infinity, which I'm going to rewrite with our b, and what we're doing is calculating the limit as b approaches our issue, which in this case was an infinity, for this function here. Yeah, and this should be an x. I don't know why I'm writing a 4 again here. So this is the function from above. 4 over x minus a quantity squared. We now know this has to equal 2. So just an improper integral. We need to figure out, you know, what a is going to be. So we just go through all of those steps. I'm going to bump this up so that this becomes x minus a to the power of a negative 2. And we'll do our power rule. So we're going to ultimately look for a limit as b goes to infinity. And then we do our power rule, so this would be 4 times x minus a to a negative 1. We divide by negative 1. We want to evaluate that from 5 to b, knowing this has to equal 2. Copy that back down. Limit as b goes to infinity. We end up with a negative 4. Let's put this back into our denominator. At the same time, I'm going to plug in my upper limit. So this would become b minus a in my denominator. I would subtract, and this is again a negative 4 over, let your x now be your lower limit, 5 minus a. And then that all has to equal 2. So from here to here, all we did is wrote it with a positive exponent, Plug in your b is for your x, that's our upper limit plugged in. Plug in your 5 for your x, that's your lower limit plugged in. So now as b gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, understanding that the numerator here will always be a negative 4, well if b becomes 10, 100, a million, 2 million, what should happen is that this part of our expression is going to become a 0. Leaving us, if that becomes a 0, with these guys getting added together ultimately, a 4 over 5a. Uh oh. Let me try that again. Doesn't like the page break. So we end up with the 4 over a 5a. You can finish this as algebra at this point. Would equal 2. So 4 would equal 10 minus 2a, 
if we multiply both sides by that 5 minus an a. And we would get ultimately what? 2a equals 6. And then our a would have to equal 3. All right. So some quality stuff there. But just again, the whole theme with these, be able to handle all these f of x's, g of x's, you know, whatever they're going to ask you to do. If they ask you for a power rule, we've done these, you know, f of x, g of x. So if I said power rule, then uh, product rule, where you go g primed times f of x plus g of x times f primed of x, be able to do that. If we got to do the quotient rule, you know, be able to do the quotient rule with these general terms, the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top, oops, times the derivative of the bottom, okay, all that good stuff, that's an f, or no it isn't, it's an h, so h primed, and then all over your h of x squared, so be able to handle all of that, and I just have to think that, knowing this is open notes, open book, that you're going to get a decent amount of those. All right, last thing. Um, we'll deviate a little bit from what we said we would be dealing with for the most part, because I want you to see some of these second derivative ideas. So particularly 17 and 19, I really want to make sure you're squared away on. Um, so number 16 says, consider this differential equation. So I gave you the differential equation. They want you to find the second derivative. So self-explanatory here, we better get that answer. The negative one would go away. Then we're really just doing the quotient rule with this. So it's your bottom. The derivative of the top would be 2y times dy dx. Quotient rule we subtract. We then leave the numerator alone. The derivative of the bottom is a 1 all over your denominator squared. We then have to plug in what dy dx was. So we would get this 2xy. So if I multiply these together, it's a 2xy. Plug in what dy dx was at the top, so negative 1 plus y squared over x minus our y squared, and again over x squared. Do a little distributing, so negative 2xy, and then here when we, that's that part, and then when we do this, the x's should cancel, and we would just end up with a, what, 2y cubed minus our y squared, and then all of that gets divided by x squared. So we can now know if we're correct or not. Take a look at this expression. Make sure that it's equivalent to this expression. It is, so we're good to go. Now, this one. Did one of these in the Taylor series, the topic that we finished here last. Here's another instance where they kind of force your hand a little bit to use what we talked about very limitedly. And if we had been in school and done that whole chapter, we would have dealt with this a little bit more. It's called the second derivative test. And it's the idea that as long as I know my first derivative is zero, I've got either a max, a min, or a point of inflection. Those are the three things that can happen that would cause my curve to have a slope of zero. The second derivative would then tell us which of these we have, because we would know if my second derivative is negative, that means I'm concave up, I'm sorry, concave down, so that would tell us that we have a max. If your second derivative was positive, that means you're concave up, and of these three possibilities, concave up would be a minimum. So we, that's what our second derivative test is used for. And they're forcing your hand here to make sure that you use that. So it says let g of x be the particular solution to this. So that just means the original function g would be our solution to this derivative. Your initial condition is for 2. And then they want to know, does g of x have a maximum, minimum, or neither at the x value of 4? You're going to justify your answer. So the reason they force your hand on this, 95% of the time, to identify if we have a maximum or a minimum, you're going to take your derivative and set it equal to zero. But think about what that would mean for this problem. This is in, ter this is in terms of two different variables. So in terms of getting a, a derivative that we can factor 
and somehow, you know, set up a sign chart and look for a positive to negative or a negative to positive sign change. We can't really do that with this one. It's not easy to, to work with that. So what they're getting at is the second derivative test. So what we would want to do to show this is let's evaluate our derivative at the point 4 comma 2. So they gave you the derivative. So even if you missed it, they gave it to us at the top. So here's our derivative. So I'm going to plug that in. So I do 2y cubed. y is a 2. Minus y squared. y again is a 2. Minus 2 times x, which is 4 times y, which is a 2. And then all over your x value squared. So if we simplify this, uh, this would be what? 16 minus 4 minus, did I mess up? Okay, sorry. See, this is why it's nice to be in front of you. So when I do something silly, you can call me out on it real quick. This is not our first derivative. That is our second derivative. We will get to that momentarily. Our first derivative, uh-oh, all these disappeared on me. Yeah, I don't know what happened to all that. I just rewrote those. Here's our derivative. Now I can go ahead and figure out what the derivative is. It's much shorter and easier for this one. So we would get a negative 1 plus y squared. So y is our 2 squared over our x value of 4. That then gives us a negative 1 plus 1. You'll see there we get our slope of 0. That typically then is telling us they want us a second derivative test. If we kind of focus in on what's happening over here then, we know we have to have a maximum or a point of inflection at that point. So if we then go through with our second derivative, so now we want our second derivative value. So that's what I was doing before. I suppose I could have left that because we needed it anyway. We want to evaluate that at 4 comma 2. So here was our second derivative. We had found that in part a and then or 16 and then if you're well you have it on paper probably hasn't gone haywire on you you'd have your second der derivative shown right there but we have mine right here I'll use that so for me it's going to be a negative 2 times x times my y which is 2 plus a 2 times my y cubed minus my y squared all of that gets divided by my x squared that was our second derivative. We now want to evaluate that. So this is our negative 8 plus 16 minus a 4. Make sure of this. No, let me correct this one. This should be what, negative 16 here. Yeah, plus 16 minus a 4, that's better. So then what we end up with is a negative one fourth. So what that now tells us is when we get this first derivative to be a zero, that tells us we either had a minimum, a maximum, or a point of inflection. That's how we can flatten out and get slopes of zero. Once we identify that our second derivative is negative, well, that we're concave down, and then that would tell us that we have a maximum there. So we would say we have a maximum because dy dx equals zero and the second derivative is equal to a negative one fourth. You could also just write, if you show the work, make sure the work is there, you could show your second derivative test, okay? All right, last one of those, 18. We've already done the work for this. Let h of x be a particular solution to the differential equation from above. Hopefully you can still see yours. I'm not going to worry about it because you have it on your paper. They do give you a different initial condition, but this is the same derivative from above. They're giving you a different initial condition, and they want us to write the second degree Taylor polynomial for h about 1. So then they kind of sneak one of these in here. So if we wanted, actually let's write it as p sub 2, second degree polynomial. We would want our functional value at x equals a 1. That's given to us. So that's right here. So that's going to be 2. 
we would then want our first derivative value at 1 comma 2. Okay, I'm back with you. I just took a little uh, break to figure out what happened to my formulas. I got them back. So let me um, rehash this a little bit. We want our second degree Taylor polynomial. We know our functional value is going to be a 2. Here's our derivative. So then what we're going to need to have here is our first derivative value at 1, and then x minus 1 to the first power over 1 factorial. Then our second derivative value at 1, x minus 1 to the second power over 2 factorial. And we can get those values here with at least the first one, our first derivative. <clears throat> so 2, um, we're going to plug in this point, 1 comma 2, into this. So if I want my first derivative evaluated at 1 comma 2, that would be a negative 1 plus y squared is what, 4 over a 1. So that's going to be a 3. So we have 3 times x minus 1 over 1 factorial. Next thing we would need is our second derivative. Remember we have that from up here, so we just have to plug it in with the new point that we were given, 1 comma 2. We'll do that. So x is a 1, y is a 2, or y cubed, 2 cubed, minus y squared. I'm just going to write that as a 4 so I can fit it in there, all over x squared which is just going to be a 1 squared. So we will get a negative 4 plus 16 minus a 4 over 1. Should be 8. So then that's our second derivative value, x minus 1 squared over 2 factorial. And then that's our second degree Taylor polynomial, about x equals 1. All right. So that wraps up that question. Um, the very last one here is just one more time, making sure we understand how to deal with the second derivative test. Like I said here, normally if you were given, you know, this as your derivative, we would set that equal to zero. I don't know why that dy dx just disappeared. My computer's wigging out on me. But we would try to set that equal to zero and set up a sign chart. Well, we can't really do that if we have two different variables in play. So it's another part, another problem that's forcing our hand a little bit in terms of how we're going to handle this, and that's with our second derivative test. So um, if we do our second derivative and evaluate, our first derivative and evaluate it at negative 2, 2, we would have 3 times a negative 2 plus 2 times 2 plus 2. And then not surprisingly then, that's going to give you your 0. So that typically then means we're being tested on the second derivative test. So slope of 0 here, here, here. So it's either a max, a min, or a point of inflection. If we then found our second derivative to this, so this will have to do the work for, we would get 3 plus 2, and then the derivative of the y is dy dx. We now want to evaluate this at the point negative 2, 2. You could substitute in your dy dx here. The reason I'm not is because the easier route to take, we know what this value is when we evaluate it at the point negative 2, 2. We just did that here. It's going to be a 0. So what this then just gives us is 3 plus 2. And then when we evaluate that at 0, we know that, I'm sorry, at the point two, negative 2, 2, that's going to give us a 0. And we then see that our second derivative is a 3. So what that then tells us is we are concave up. That then tells us we are in this problem dealing with a minimum. Okay, so um, hopefully that all makes some sense. Uh, any questions, let me know. And uh, good luck if I don't talk to you guys before the test next Tuesday. But I will probably... You know, we're obviously doing a Zoom for you guys today on Thursday, and then we'll probably do one real quick on Monday for any last questions and make sure we're all squared away. If I don't see or talk to you guys then, then good luck on Tuesday on this test. Have a good night.